Hello, my name is Todd Gerke, and I'm the author of a new uh, book named Coach Will, Story of Achieving Uncommon Sales Success. Now, this is a story about a typical American salesman struggling to succeed. And uh, it's the, his name is Michael Walker, and he had a comfortable home in the suburbs with a three-car garage and enough bedrooms for his family and one to spare for guests. He had a beautiful family, but uh, every day as he drove to work, he played a little game with himself. And, and yesterday... Yeah, he saw nothing bigger than an F-350, just an oversized pickup truck, and then he saw it. White knuckled hands clutched his steering wheel. The orange dump truck careened towards him in the left lane, and his thoughts would be devastating. Of course, the truck would be full of sand just to make it that much more formidable, and one quick yank, it would all be over. His leased Chrysler 300 obliterated. Now, that would make for a pretty short book, wouldn't it? And of course, he wouldn't actually do that. He was smarter than that. But uh, it crossed his mind more and more often now, and it seemed that endless opportunities presented themselves when that mindset gripped him. See, he glanced at the image in the mirror on his visor, and the face that stared back at him looked closer to 65 than 35. And he just thought, why? I mean, just last night, his neighbor had slapped him on the back and told him he had it all. But uh, why didn't he believe that? His first five years in the mortgage business started right before things got good and uh, just ahead of the refinance boom. And that first year, he'd made more money than he'd ever made in his life, yet he was scared to death. The nagging question in his mind that kept him up all night didn't make any sense. He kept asking himself, what would happen when this all ends? The second year, he nearly doubled his income. Even though he remained at that level for the next three years, he started this internal chant that had become his mantra. He said, the burden is more than I can bear. The burden is more than I could bear. And the promise of a bright future disappeared in the maze of his anxiety, and he was afraid. He was afraid of what would happen if he could no longer provide for his family, afraid because he knew the only person he could rely on was himself. And with each passing day, he believed less and less of himself. Well, he'd show up to work, and just as he knew it would, the market began to turn. Now, he'd attended seminars and motivational tapes, but the fire was burning out, and the business got harder, and of course, so did life. And he'd get up later and later every morning and would find himself sitting in his car in the parking lot, staring at the front door of his office building. Sometimes he'd sat there for 10, 15 minutes or more, just listening to the radio and staring into space. Foreclosures skyrocketed along with interest rates and gas prices. The newspapers had labeled him a crook. Not him, personally, but mortgage people. Him. Then the inevitable happened, a month with no paycheck, followed by another. Maxing out his credit cards, he hit the bottom of the financial barrel. And the less business he did, the worse he felt. And the worse he felt, the less business he did. He had lost his way. Well, he'd become close friends with his title company rep and was meeting him for lunch. And he wondered if his uh, buddy knew how bad things had gotten, and his friend Scott was an upbeat, high-energy guy that had been in the industry for a long time, and um, you know, Michael knew he could use some of his advice, and, and the image of the orange dump truck would flash through his mind as he drove towards the Double Eagle Steakhouse and, that Scott had selected, and uh, you know, he couldn't help but feel like he's almost out of gas in the stupid car he leased, and he's not sure which credit card even has enough room to put fuel in the tank. And he doesn't have money for the valet when he gets there, and he sure hopes Scott picks up the tab instead of wanting to split it. And he really belonged more at McDonald's than he than he did at this place. And um, he lucked out that he was able to find a parking space where he could walk fairly closely to to meet with Scott. And he looks and he sees Scott standing on the sidewalk in, in uh, the front door and his signature attire. It's a gray suit with the white shirt with the top button undone and the tie kind of hanging loosely around his collar. And he had a five o'clock shadow even though it wasn't quite noon. And he had a wide smile that set him apart from everybody else. And for a moment, Michael envied the, the small man's big energy because he was no more than five foot six and 
He had this huge black Nike sports watch on that was much too big for his wrist, but it fit his persona to a T. Um, he wasn't the grizzly, bearded, kill him elk and carry it out on his back kind of a mountain man, but more the rock climbing, kayaking, bungee jumping sort of character. And His Sicilian heritage supplied him with a permanent dark tan and a, a head of thick, curly black hair. So they walk in, and, and Scott's flirting with the hostess, and, and they sit down, and and he's perusing through the menu, and he's just in shock looking at the prices of everything, and, and um, $15 for a salad. Uh, a glass, or no, a 10-ounce bottle of Coca-Cola is $2.50, and he's, he's really getting flushed, and He's searching around to find out whatever the cheapest thing on the menu. And, and of course, he finds it, so he orders a chicken. And um, as they're sitting there having their meal, the, he starts to reflect a little bit with uh, Scott. And, you know, they're talking the normal, lighthearted lunch talk. And, and then things get a little bit deeper for him. And um, Scott asks him, essentially, uh, if he were to ask for help, what would he ask for? And of course, Michael immediately shoots out, well, money. What else? And Scott says, well, I don't know. You tell me what else. And, um, you know, Michael thought about it for a little bit, and he says, I don't know if money or the lack of it is his real problem. I mean, he's really coming to grips with where he was, and he's thinking, do I just need enough to tie me over until I get back on my feet? Am I doing anything to get back on my feet? You know, he's wondering why I didn't follow up on leads that he'd been given, and, and um, realizes that there's another issue, and, and that he is in a spot right now that all he wants to do is go home and hide and avoid life, but that isn't reality, and it won't fulfill him at his core. Besides, doing that will not teach his kids how to lead their lives. And there's got to be more. So money is an issue, but it's just the issue at hand. It's not the true problem. So, you know, Scott runs him through an exercise, and he tells him to look around the room and identify everything he sees that's brown. The wood floor, the tables, the mahogany bar, a man's suit sitting next to him, the stem of a plant in the corner, finding everything he can, the bread on the table, the coke in the glass. Um, once he's found it all, he has him close his eyes and try and remember everything he saw that was brown. And he gives him a minute. He says, nod your head when you think you've got them all. So Michael's playing along, and Scott says, are you ready? All right, now tell, he says, now tell me, with your eyes closed, four things you saw in the room that were blue. Well, Michael drew a blank. He had no idea what was blue. He wasn't looking for it. He opened his eyes and began to scan around the room. And Scott says, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? He said, the, the pot is blue, which matches the smaller blue one sitting in right here on their own table. The woman eating the brown bread was wearing a blue suit. I'm sorry, a blue dress, and the man sitting across from her is in a blue suit. And the chandeliers in the room have blue sapphires in them. And there's several liquor bottles that were blue behind the bar. And even the bottle of water. Um, he was about to drink was blue, but he missed it all because he was too focused on brown to notice. And the reality is, is that's how everyone sees the world. And Scott explains to him that he believes we all stare at the world as if we're wearing a pair of sunglasses. And as we live our lives, we apply different shades of color to our lenses, tinting them with their experiences. And after a while, some people can no longer see what's actually in front of them because their lenses are so distorted by the colors of their past, they don't see the beauty, the potential, or the good. They no longer look through their lenses, they look at them. What you're experiencing is, is not abnormal, it happens to everybody. And it happened to Scott, it's happened to me. And sometimes what you need to do is clean your lenses and take another look. So we'll take a pause right here. This is the first couple of chapters of Coach Will, but I want you to reflect on that, and I want you to think about the experiences that you've got and what your lenses may look like from your experiences, positive and negative, and see if maybe there isn't um, an opportunity to take them off, clean them up a little bit, and put them back on. So I hope you enjoyed the first 
couple of chapters of Coach Will, and uh, look for another one soon. Thanks so much.